Fixed OTV, the Gainsborough studio. You join us with a further episode of This Is Your Life with young Eric in his 88th year. We're looking back today to some rare footage that was shot back in the mid 80s, mid 80s, mid -80s yeah. 30 years or so ago. And bear in mind that would have been cine film, so it would have been film that's been transposed, transposed again. But what it does do is gives a, a superb flavor of where Eric uh, moved and set up the production of that well known uh, beverage, Norfolk Punch. Now, one thing I noticed when I reflected back on what you said last time. The monks gave reference to phases of the moon. And I thought that was very interesting. So what did it all mean? Well, you've got to remember that this recipe that I found within all the old documents, you know, where yes. the deeds of the house and what, which went right back to medieval days and there were Tudor copies of this old recipe. Right. Uh, the monks claimed that it uh, did everything from curing the ague downwards, the plague, everything. As they did. And of course there were 30 herbs of spices in it. Really? And it's 80, a lot. 18 potent herbs. Really? And one of the big things about it was that of course um, they had to be picked at the right phase of the moon. It took me an awful lot of research to find. Yeah. A lot of the names had changed, the quantities were difficult to interpret. Yeah, brilliant. But in the end I did it, of course. And But the phase of the moon part is extremely interesting because it's completely lost today. Nothing yeah. is done by the phases of the moon. It's when you and get you've the got to remember. You've mm. got to remember that in those days, the moon and the... Uh, nature was far more oh, yes. uh, prevalent. Mm. For argument's sake, uh, the they, discovered, they discovered that a woman, for argument's sake, would only have a baby mm -hmm. at the right phase of the moon when the tide was going out. Uh, you, sure never, you, never have, you never <laughs> have a baby when the tide is coming in. You know? So yep. in other words, even babies are born, not today, they, they, they're, <laughs> Just the, well the doctors the side they when they have. But yeah. in those days, it was all by the moon, and of course, people don't realize that once again some of the uh, plants which yes. we use the herbs we use they actually follow the moon round you they know how the indeed. sunflower yeah. follows the sun round yes well uh, herbs follow some of the, the herbs moon. follow the moon round indeed and they at the p full moon they're, they're at they're their peak. best at their yes. peak and if they're picked at that right phase of the moon you get the best qualities amazing when it? the phase of the moon goes down it just shows you how we know a lot today, but we've also lost oh, a lot. Oh, we've lost a huge amount. Absolutely huge amount. Now, just a quickie before we uh, bring the film on. Um, fortunately, I've found or bought a Cambridgeshire and Peterborough book, and I note that Otwell has Otwell Hall actually shown oh, yes. on the well, map. Man, well, and man, it's man, off Town Street, off the B1412. That's absolutely right. And yeah. they, that all comes off the A1101 which is the back road going up to Wisbeach to take you in to eventually Peterborough or Wisbeach. Yes. Now, I used to track up that road, oh. but I always used to go to Outwell and what was the other place? Ferry Bridge or somewhere. But I've never been to Outwell, yeah. and I see, should have been. But I should you have see, gone you've there. got to remember that today yes. we just have names. We but do. in those days, names meant something. Mm. So everything the tide used to come up to that the river was uh, nearly a mile wide there yeah. the tide used to come up before the and drainage. it was very br br uh, bracken water oh, and right. salty water so you had the up well which was the upper well so it's the only place you could get fresh water from and out out well which was the outer well where you got fresh water as well amazing so the villages were named after the wells which of course were most very important, important most thing, important their water yes so there we are magic so Dear viewer, what you have now is a treat. This is Eric, in his slightly younger day, <laughs> con doing a conducted tour around the manor, and I find it very interesting. Hopefully you will too. And the church, and the Oh, and the sorry. Church. The tour wasn't only the manor house, it was also the church, which had within it a lot of significant things. Because all the money from the tours used to go to the church. Uh, this, was, this was the whole arrangement. That was the deal. That was the deal, because we were trying to raise money for the church. Okay. So off we go, let's row the film. Thank you. 
A very warm welcome to Well Manor Hall. My name is Eric St. John Foti and I'm your host and guide today. Now we have a recorded history of over a thousand years here. In 974, Well Manor was given to the Ramsey Abbey monks, the Benedictine monks, and it was confirmed by Royal Charter. Now, the first real bit of history comes a few years after the invasion of England by William the Conqueror. 1066, the date we all remember, and about 1070, Hereward the Wake was elected here. This is the spot where he was elected to fight the last battle against the Normans. Unfortunately, he lost it. But he lived here for a short period after his defeat. The next little bit of history that we all know about is, of course, relating to King John. At the beginning of the 13th century, about 1210 or thereabouts, King John was travelling from Lynn to York, and it's recorded he was crossing the Weller Stream, which flowed between here and Wisbeach, which was then on the coastline, and it was about a mile wide, and the tide came in, and you all know the story, it swept away his baggage train and he lost all his crown jewels. But the bit that you don't know is, of course, that shortly afterwards, the abbot here rebuilt his house and church. Now, the base of the house on the undercroft dates from that period. Now, in 1339, there was the Black Death. In 1360, there was a great flood, and the house and church were rebuilt again. Now, this main wing dates from that period. They, st they started making bricks hereabout in the year 1300. So what you see before you are some of the earliest bricks uh, in Norfolk. The ground floor and the first floor are of these medieval bricks. The top floor was put in in 1480 by Thomas Cook, who was chaplain to Henry VII. And if you look carefully, you can see the difference between the Tudor bricks of the top floor and the medieval bricks of the ground and first floor. The items to look for are the two rows of blind arcading. These were put in as whole bricks and rubbed to that shape. The buttresses are also very typical of that period. The east wing was rebuilt in Victorian days. So you've got really a textbook of brickwork over the centuries. The east wing shows you the modern brick, which is slightly wider. Then of course the top floor, with the Tudor brick, which is narrower still, going down to the medieval brick, which is still even still narrower. The windows were, of course, modernised in 1660. Now, in 1539, Henry VIII suppressed the Ramsey Abbey monks after they'd been here for nearly 600 years, and he sold the house, the church, and 2,000 acres to a man called Edmund Beaupre for £282, which was good value even in those days. Now that gives you a potted history of the house and church because everything that was done to the house at the same period something was done to the church. This is a fine example of a prebendary, which is just another name for ecclesiastical, fortified manor house and church. It used to have a curtain wall which went all the way round the house and church with a moat round the outside. All to the left now of the fortifications are these towers which you can see here. These are particularly interesting because in Norman days, of course, they had square towers. Once they discovered gunpowder, they went over to round towers, and this is an interim period when they had octagonal towers. These date from about 1360 or thereabouts. Now, the tower which you see on the left here contains Roman bricks at the top. These are narrower still, and obviously they came from something which was on this site in Roman days. Upwell, or Well, or Welly as it was known in those days, was an island. It is still, of course, an island today, known as Upwell Isle. But we have, under this courtyard, the remains of a mosaic pavement, which we believe is Roman. And I think one of these days we're going to have a dig to find out more about it. Now, this is a lovely example of a medieval church. In medieval days, everything was symbolic, and the church represented the body of Christ. And just as Christ's body was pierced with five wounds, so a medieval church is always pierced with five doors. Now if you count them, there are two here on the south side, there's one on the west side, one on the north side, which makes four, and you're probably saying, where's the fifth? Now if you look up at the base of the tower there, you'll see the little door representing the wound in Christ's side. Now if you note that tower, it's the same brickwork as the fortification tower, which is the clue as to what that tower was. The 
fortifications, the 12 foot curtain wall with the moat, went all the way round the house and the church and of course came to the end of the church there. Notice at the top of the tower there's the place for a bell and there used to be a silver sanctus bell in that holder up there. This disappeared about the time of the Reformation. We're still hoping that one of these days we'll dig it up in the garden somewhere. We have a Victorian photograph showing another of our fortification towers where you can see this building here. Now this shows very clearly how the curtain wall with the moat went all the way round the house and the church. The main road leading up to the house used to come in front of the church here. Of course now it's been changed and the road that leads now into the house is known as the new road although it was put in in 1836. The classic feature of a prebendary manor house and church is that the house door and the church door are in line as they are here. Those of you who come from the Fens will know all about the ancient practice of Widdershin. Now this was a way of raising the devil, although why anyone should want to raise the devil I don't know. What they used to do was to walk six times anti-clockwise round an old church on a dark night with spells and incantations to raise the devil. And if you look closely at these lions, you'll find that their heads are turned sharply to the right in a most unnatural angle. And this is to counter that practice of Widdershin. It's to show you that everything to do with Christianity is clockwise to counter the devil and his works, which are anti-clockwise. Now we're going to go through this lovely old west door into this church. Welcome to this wonderful old medieval church of Upwell St. Peter. It is acknowledged as having one of the finest, if not the finest, angel roofs in East Anglia. And if you cast your eyes upwards here, you will see these wonderful angels. It was put in in 1480 or thereabouts by Thomas Cook, who was chaplain to Henry VII, and there are 156 angels up there. Each one of them is holding a different item of Christ's passion, and these particular angels are renowned for three reasons. First of all, all the wings are completely original and unrestored. Normally, the wings are damaged because Cromwell's men didn't like ornamentation in churches and they used to use them for musket practice. They fired their muskets at them and damaged the wings. But these ones were left alone because Cromwell rented a house down the road here called Mullicourt House, which has since been pulled down, and I suppose he didn't want to upset his friends and neighbours and in consequence left the angels alone. The second reason they're so interesting is because they were immortalised by Dorothy L. Sayers in her book The Nine Tailors. As you will remember, there was a missing necklace and it was found at the base of one of these angels. The reason she brought this roof into her story was, of course, because her father was the vicar of Christ Church, which is just down the road here, and she knew this church well. It came under this rectory. The third reason that this roof is so well known and liked is because normally in an angel roof you have one demon and you search for the one demon. In this roof we don't have just one demon, every main figure over the chancel is a demon. These angels have a cantilever effect and because of them the, they stop the roof from spreading. They are pivoted on the top of the walls and architects tell us that if it wasn't for them either the walls would have to be thicker or they would have to have buttresses on the outside or they would have to be more roof ties. So not only are they beautiful to look at, but they serve a very advanced architectural purpose. Look at the gilding on the angel's wings. This reminds us how in medieval days, churches were lovely colourful places. There were bright wall paintings, rude screens. People came to church to bring colour into their lives. Now with all this wonderful workmanship and attention to detail, you're probably wondering why they couldn't get the roof on straight. Now if you look up there, you'll see that the point of the 1480 roof isn't in line with the 1360 window. Now this isn't bad workmanship, this shows you how very accurate they were when they built a church in the medieval period. They didn't just build a church, they built it facing towards the east. And not just towards the east, it was in the direction where the sun rose on the morning of the feast day of the saint. In this case, St. Peter on the 29th of June. In 1660, when Charles II came back on the throne after the Cromwellian period, he decreed by royal act of parliament that every church should display a royal coat of arms over the chancel. 
Now this one here is of that period or shortly afterwards. Note particularly the lion's eyes. Now normally on the royal coat of arms the lion's eyes are closed or blank but on this one his eyes are wide open. Here is the second royal coat of arms. This is a Victorian one. Now Upwell St. Peter is probably one of the only churches in England with two royal coats of arms. This one is absolutely magnificent. Just look at this workmanship. See the depth of the carving. You can see how my fingers go right inside here. Look at the chain round the unicorn's waist. Although this is carved out of one solid piece of wood, the carving is so intricate and accurate that the chain actually moves. And Another unusual feature are these wonderful bench ends. They're known as poppy heads and they only are found in Fenland churches. This part of the world was known as poppy land for centuries but of course they don't get their name from that. It comes from the French poupe or doll and I suppose if we look at them they do look a little bit like a doll's head. Now we're going to look at another memorial of the not so distant past. Now as we come through here you can see the churching pew. There are not many of these left in the fens nowadays and it reminds us how not so very long ago once a woman had had a baby she was considered to be unclean and they had to sit in a separate pew. Now this is the churching pew here and it still has on it here very faintly put churching pew. Note how there's no ornamentation on the door unlike the others all carved. There's no nowhere for them to kneel on it either and of course here straight in front of the font they were able to kneel in segregation until they'd been churched and made clean once again. Here we have an ancient form of firefighting equipment. All the houses hereabout were thatched with either straw or reed and frequently caught fire. When this happened they would rush to the church get these giant poles with giant iron pieces carved on them and use them to pull the burning thatch off the houses. This prevented the houses from burning to the ground and all they had to do was to rethatch them. It used to take two horses to pull the thatch off and they were hitched to these wonderful poles. Now here is another great treasure of the church. This is a Peter's Pence lectern. Now you'll see plenty of lecterns like this all through the country but there are only four others like this one. And what makes it so different is that although it's got the body of an eagle, it's got the head of a cock, including the cock's comb. In medieval days, everything was symbolic. And this reminded you that you're in the church of St. Peter. And of course, St. Peter denied Christ three times before the cock crew, hence this. It's made of latin, which is the material they used before they discovered brass, 1480 or thereabouts, it's hollow, and it's a wonderful thing. The symbolism carries on with the triple denial being portrayed with the three claws on the feet. And of course, if we look down further, we'll see the three lions that it's standing on. Notice that their heads are turned sharply to the right. And this is to counter the practice of widowship. But as I say, a very great treasure and only four others like it in the whole country. This is an example of the poverty of the fens. Here we have a memorial which is done on canvas and there are very few of these surviving in Fenland churches today. Notice here how it's all on canvas and of course they were so poor in those days, part of them, that at least they had a memorial even though it was done in this way. This is the memorial to James Lee who founded the charity which gave 500 weight of coal every year to the widows of Upwell and seven shillings in June. Notice how, of course, this is a standard marble memorial. We had someone who went from Upwell, or Well, Welly, or Weller, as it was known in those days, who went to the First Crusade at the beginning of the 12th century. And here is his coffin top set in the wall of the church. If you look carefully here, you can see the cross of St. John carved on the coffin top. The joy of this church is that it's not just a dead memorial. It is a living church and services are conducted here regularly. The services during the week are held in this lovely little chapel of the resurrection which commemorates the dead of the two world wars. The win window which you see here commemorates the dead of the first world war. The bottom right hand panel shows you the merchant navy and the royal navy. 
The bottom left-hand panel shows you the Army and the Air Force. It's interesting to note that they're both in Kharki, and then we remember that, of course, at that time, the Air Force hadn't gone into Air Force Blue. In the corner is an ombre where the Blessed Sacrament is reserved. And I know that all of you who are watching this account of this lovely old medieval church will join and say a small prayer to go up with all the others that have gone up over the centuries from this wonderful building. Well, here we are in the actual belfry where it all took place. Dorothy L. Sayers' story, The Nine Tailors, got its name from the number of times a bell was rung when someone died. It was rung three times three for a man, three times two for a woman, or three times one for a child, followed by one toll for every year of the man's age. Now, this belfry here is particularly interesting because it is the only one in this area where we have a spare bell. When the clock strikes, it's able to strike at the same time that the bringers are ringing the quarter peal, or the peal which is given in the story. Now this makes it very definite that this is the site of Dorothy L. Sayers story, because there's nowhere else that this could happen except here. grave of William Barley, who went from Upwell to fight for his country at the Battle of Waterloo. He returned here and he died shortly afterwards of a decline, which shows that they had depression even in those days. We had 67 people died of cholera hereabouts and they're buried in four of these communal graves. Just to give you the idea of how people feared cholera in those days, they used to think that if you touched that stone you'd be dead within 24 hours. The local story is, of course, that on a dark night you'll hear a weird and eerie groaning coming from this grave. And the children used to put their ear to this stone and they said they could hear the grumbling and mumbling of the people under it. Now, the reason why it's done in this way is because other graves, when the graveyard gets full, they bury other bodies on top. But the cholera grave is marked with this plain stone with the single letter C so that nobody will ever open it because the cholera virus never dies, and if it was opened, it would sp spread that virus once again. Another feature to look for in Fenland graveyards are these very heavily carved gravestones. These are fine examples of what are known as the flattened school of gravestone carvers. Now, from the year 1700 onwards, for about 200 years, these were made at Fletton, which is not so far away, and shipped out to all the Fenland graveyards because, of course, there was no stone in the fens in those days. The local stonemason would have written the local details down at the bottom here. Now, today, we can read and write, but we cannot understand the story here. In those days, anybody walking along would be able to understand exactly what was being told here. Everything had some significance. Everything was symbolic. But, as I say, a very fine example of the flattened school of greystone carvers. Today, Upwell is renowned for a number of things. First of all, it's the longest village in England. It's over four miles in length. Secondly, it's renowned as having the finest women in England. Thirdly, it's the home of the flower festival. The very first flower festival was held in the house here in 1953. It was moved to the church in 1954, and then they founded the Flower Festival Association, and the practice has spread all over the country. And lastly, of course, but not least, it's the home of Norfolk Punch. Now, in medieval days, Upwell was an island. It is still known today as Upwell Isle. It was important because here it was the only place that you could find fresh water. It was surrounded by the tidal. Um, the tide came in right up to here. Of course, it was salty and brackish. But the fresh water well was the place from which Upwell got its name. In those days, it was known as Well or Welly or Weller. And this is the upper well of Upwell, from which, as I say, the village got its name. Now, now here we have the four riddles of Upwell. The clue to the answers lies at the bottom of the well. The first riddle is what shatters without breaking. 
Of course, the answer is the reflection at the bottom of the well. What do you cast down to raise up? Many people get this wrong, thinking it's a bucket. The real answer is, of course, your eyes. You cast them down to the reflection to raise them up to the stained glass above your head. The next riddle is what is at a distance yet within arm's length? Once again, the clue to the answer is at the bottom of the well, because there you will see that the reflection is at a distance, yet the stained glass is within arm's length above your head. What goes back to remote times yet has just been made anew? The answer is, of course, the well itself. At the bottom there are medieval bricks, yet we have just rebuilt the top part here. There is a second answer, which is Norfolk Punch. The ancient medieval recipe goes back to remote times, which is made from the water in the well here, yet has just been rediscovered and is now being made anew. We are now in the herborium, where all the herbs are prepared. We keep as closely as possible to the ancient recipe. We make infusions, this is when you pour boiling water over the herbs. We make decoctions, which is where you boil the herbs with water, and we make distillation. Now, the herbs themselves are pounded in the pestle and mortar exactly as the monks would have done, and we do this with many, many of the herbs, and then, of course, we conduct the various processes. The herbs are made in a puncher. This is an obsolete uh, measure which contained over 80 gallons, and this is, of course, how Norfolk Punch gets its name. The monks claimed that it cleared the chest, settled the stomach, and uplifted the spirits. And, of course, it does all of that. And here we have the great 300-year-old linden tree. Now, linden is only the Saxon word for lime. This is, of course, the old English lime tree. And it is from this tree that we get the lime leaves and the lime flowers that are used in the Norfolk punch. Behind it, nestling there, is one of the fortification towers. And you can see from this point that it has been adapted for use today for the doves. There are over 30 herbs and spices in our original old Norfolk punch, including over 18 potent herbs. We grow as many of them as possible here, and where we have to buy in, we still try always to include our own herbs where possible. Now we make infusions, decoctions and distillations, and we even pick and grow the herbs at the right phase of the moon. The ancient recipe specifies that the herbs should be picked at specific phases of the full moon. And strangely enough, we find that many of the herbs even follow the moon round at night. Once the full moon has stopped, or that specific phase has stopped, we find that the herbs wilt. So it shows that the monks knew what they were doing when they made these specifications. We feel very strongly about modern fertilizers, and as far as possible, we do everything organically because we feel that otherwise this does damage to the nervous system. And in any case, we know that the medieval monks didn't have any of our modern fertilizers and relied entirely on organic means for increasing their crops. Our modern high-speed bottling plant was opened in July 1986 by Barbara Cartland, who is the world's largest selling novelist and advocate of healthy living. Twelve months later, we have just got planning permission to double the size of the factory. Miss Barbara Cartland takes our punch regularly and swears by it. Now, over in the far corner is where a little boy appears. And the last time he spoke to anyone, he said, I don't like you, go away, and he vanished. Now, the room he appears outside is, of course, a toilet. And sometimes our visitors come and they go there and they can hear a child playing with the toilet roll holder behind the door. And they keep saying, would you hurry up, please? And nothing happens. And then they open the door, and they find there's nobody in there. So we know our little boy is still fairly active. We've tried moving the toilet roll holder, but it doesn't seem to have any effect. Now, we've got other stories, but I'll tell you these as we go round. This room shows you how a Victorian rector used to live. When you think that in those days the living here was worth between three and six thousand pounds a year at a time when a house parlour maid was earning between three and six pounds a year, you can see that they weren't doing too badly. In those days, it used to take 14 full-time people to run this house and gardens. Today, we manage on six part-timers. 
This is a lovely room. Take this fireplace, for instance. Here we have a full set of Minton tiles depicting the death of Arthur. These are about 1836 or thereabouts, and it's extremely rare to find a complete set like this. Now here we are up on the naval memorabilia landing. We've got some interesting I items here. Up here at the end of the shelf, the galleon there was made by the Napoleonic prisoners of war. And there was a Napoleonic prisoner of war camp at Maney, just up the road. The coconut at the end of the shelf was carved by them as well. Over here we see Nelson's victory. And the frame is made from the copper and the wood taken from the victory during one of its refits. The reason we've got it here is, of course, because Nelson was a good Norfolk lad. Underneath is the Queen Mary. It's exactly 50 years ago that she was launched, and as you know, she was the first of the great queens. Today, she's moored off the Californian coast, where she's used as a conference centre. Round and about, there's a lot of other ma naval memorabilia, wooden blocks and tackles, diving helmets, all sorts of bits and pieces. This is the Great Bed of Diddlington. Now, this is made from the doors of Diddl Diddlington Castle. And the old tradition was that if you visited the castle and placed your hand on the doorpost and made a wish, your wish was granted you. And apparently royalty has done this. Nowadays, of course, we place our hands on the bedposts and make the wish, because they are the old doorposts. You've all heard of the Great Bed of Ware. And the sleeping area of the Great Bed of Diddlington is exactly the same as the sleeping area of the Great Bed of Ware. The big difference is, of course, that the Great Bed of Ware is in the Victoria and Albert Museum, and this is one of our spare bedrooms and is slept in regularly. This is the solar or great bedroom. Now here we have the gigantic fireplace. It was a huge room in those days. Where my hand is is the centre of the fireplace. Now, we uncovered this fireplace ourselves, and of course, we were going to open it right out. There's a petition here. But when we got so far, we discovered this little plastered out compartment here with a strange stone in it. So we called the experts in, and they told us that this is a hagstone. And apparently, in the Middle Ages, when this fireplace was blocked up, they believed that if they blocked a fireplace up, a witch would come down the chimney and take up her abode in the blocked up fireplace. So they used to put a hagstone here. It's like a uh, mousetrap for witches, I suppose, because a witch or a warlock touches a hagstone, they're gone in a cloud of fire and brimstone. Now, this is probably the only hagstone in England, still where it was put in the Middle Ages, and it's never been moved. It's got some very strange qualities, because some people feel it, and they feel it hot. Some people feel it cold. Some people feel it neither one thing nor another. I've got one visitor who's been back five times because she swears she feels it hot. Now, if you touch it, there's also a strange hole in it. And if you put your thumb in that hole, if you're just a liar, you will feel the stone. But if you're a really bad liar, it'll actually grip your thumb. You can, of course, see the remainder of the fireplace through this special window, which we put through here. Now, here we have got the ghostly spinning wheels. These are the ones which the ghost of the old lady use. This is the old one, which when we come in here sometimes is moving, just as if someone's using it. No drafts, no vibrations, and of course if there was, this is the one which would be moving, because this is very loose, the new one. I like to show you things which you won't see anywhere else. Now this is a perfectly ordinary 1360 window. What makes it so different is that the glass in the right panel is the original glass. Ecclesiastical glass of this period is pretty scarce. Domestic glass still in situ is practically unheard of. We uncovered this window ourselves. The only reason the glass survived is because someone built a turret on the outside. You can still see the brickwork through the glass. And of course, when they bricked up on the other side, there, when we uncovered it, was the original glass. It's known as muff glass, and it's the first form of window glass as we know it today. Now you must tread warily up this staircase. This, of course, is our outside turret staircase, and this is where the ghostly monk walks slowly up and down, looking perhaps for his 
girlfriend who was bricked up in the wall. The landing I'm standing on here is exactly where the bottom pinching episode took place. So take care. Now here in the dining room, we have a ghostly parlour maid who appears occasionally and helps you into your chair. Above here, the sum of the armour which was used in the film Cromwell because of our Cromwellian connection. Just above the long case clock there is a chastity belt. You don't often see them about. And we had a group of WI in here not so very long ago and I heard them talking and one said to the other, she said, what a small waist she must have had. And the other one replied, yes, my dear, but of course if she'd been any fatter than that, she wouldn't have been worth preserving. Now I'm sure you all know what they were used for. They used to lock their wives in these when they went off to battle. But their great worry was, what would happen if they were killed on a foreign field? So what they used to do, they used to give the key to their best friend at home. Now I'm sure you've all heard the classic story about the man who went off to battle and he locked his wife up in one of these things and he gave the key to his best friend and he'd gone about 20 minutes down the road when his best friend came galloping after him shouting, stop, stop, you've given me the wrong key. This is our little chapel of Our Lady and St. John. It's the smallest Roman Catholic chapel still in regular use. The altar came from Ely Place in London where it was brought for safety during the last war. Above the altar is a reliquary which contains a splinter of the true cross. As you know, they went on the Crusades to find the true cross and this is a splinter believed to come from that time. Now here you have got the fruit of all our labours, our original old Norfolk punch. Now if ever you're feeling tense, tired or low in spirits, all you have to do is to pour out as much as you're going to drink, heat it up in a saucepan until it's piping hot, sit down in your favourite chair, inhale the gentle vapours to clear the mind and the chest, and then sit for five or ten minutes. And you'll feel all your worries drain off you, you'll feel your energy come flooding back, and you'll never feel the same again, I promise you. Now, there's a lot of poppy in this. I hasten to add that it's the cornflower poppy and not the opium poppy, but it has the same effect. It releases your tensions. And it's tension and strain today, which is the cause of most of our problems. <coughs> now, very often, when you're going along in a car, you can't heat up your Norfolk punch. So we make a Norfolk delight. Now, each box of this contains all the herbs that are contained in a bottle of Norfolk punch. But all you have to do is to suck a piece slowly and gain all the benefit of those herbs. Next, we make a Norfolk tisane. Now, this is a herbal tea which surpasses all other herbal teas. If you want to have a glue vine, this is a lovely way of doing it. Just pour a little bit of warm white wine over the top, heat it up, and you've got a marvellous glue vine for apres ski. This comes either in the tea bags or in the loose, in the tins. We have a Norfolk punch herb and hot pillow. The practice of this goes right back to Tudor days. It's the action of the head on the pillow which releases the power of the herbs. And this is marvellous for migraines or headaches. Another of our products is the Christmas pudding, which of course is traditional. And this, with Norfolk punch in it, is simply wonderful. It contains no animal fats, no refined sugars, no artificial preservatives or colouring. It's a perfectly natural product, but the taste is out of this world. Of course, they used to have Christmas pudding all through the year. It was known as plum pudding, spelt with a B. In Victorian days, it became confined to Christmas because of poverty. But we have brought it back throughout the year as our Sunday pudding, which is here so you can enjoy the flavour and joy of Christmas throughout the year. Now here are our little Norfolk worry monks. This is an old Norfolk tradition to hold a stone in your hand. Now each of our worry monks is of a different shape and the idea is that when you're worried you hold one of these in your hand and all your worries will drain into the monk. Each one is different, each is an individual work of art. We make them in our own pottery here. You always pick a worried-looking one because you know he's a good worker. 
Now, another product which we make, which is confined to this area, is our samphire sea foam. Now, hereabouts, we have our own form of samphire, which is a seaweed. And this was known by the Romans, and they used to use it as a medicine, as a food, for all sorts of purposes, and we have recreated this marvellous skin food based on the samphire. And it brings all the goodness of the sea to the skin and rejuvenate, rejuvenates it. Now there you've got a range of our products, and I do hope that you will try them and enjoy them. And last but not least is, of course, our little punch pot. Now this punch pot you cannot put down until you drain the last drop. And of course, this is a little bit of Norfolk humour, because it's got a rounded top. You fill it, and if you don't drain the last drop, when you put it down, it'll fall over. So, and finally, to remind us that we're indebted to the Benedictine monks who were here for nearly 600 years, we've got our own special tea towel here commemorating them. We do another one which shows all the claims for the herbs, and all the monks said that the herbs would do for you. So now. I do hope that if you haven't tried our Norfolk Punch, you will try it, and those of you who know it and love it will continue to enjoy it. I hope if you are ever near Well Manor Hall, you will come and visit us, and good luck, good cheer, and God bless you all. Okay, well, Eric, you must have had great fun. Who shot the film? I can't remember. Can you not? I can't remember. So it uh, uh, wasn't David Lean or somebody like that? Oh, no. But, but no. you've got to remember the quality. Well, they didn't have HD cameras in those no, days. No. So the quality wasn't good. But it's a very... Uh, oh, it's superb. It's very, Atmospheric. And of, and, of course, you've got a lot of interesting information, which I did a lot of research from. I did most of that research myself. Yes. And uh, I used to do that regularly. That's why some of them sound a little bit stereotyped. <laughs> but uh, but I'm sure that the, the <laughs> residents of Otwell of today, there will be a lot of people that have moved in, those that have moved out, mm will probably be very fascinated yeah. in, in, in the history as yes. as shown and, and things like that and we need more of, don't and we? And what is even more interesting is that, of course, when I sold out, which is come in the next episode, right. uh, to IDV, who are the biggest drink manufacturers in the world, oh, are they really? and yes. we sold out to them because they put on the market Purdy's and Aqua Libra, which are still on the market. Yes, right. And, uh, they were competitive. They put, well, mm. nobody had herbal drinks before Norfolk Punch. That was ah, the first herbal right. drink. Now there are three or four hundred of them. <laughs> a lot mm. of competition. Mm. But it was the first one. IDV wanted to have the original. That's why it bought Norfolk Punch. And Purdy's and Aqua Libra are still herbal drinks. They're right. still on the market today. And so my, I must put, try my, these. my, my ideas <laughs> were copied and carried yeah. on with, which is, which is a good thing. Well, it, it's sort of, um, you have made a contribution to the well-being of the nation. Well, thank but, you. Well, well I mean, if you're saying, if that grave digger, and grave diggers are right at the lead, leading edge of life, <laughs> if he was so convinced that his wife had a recovery and Norfolk Punch was a part of that, then, you know, it should be, be I, I mean, I remember uh, our family doctor subscribing a, uh, a bottle of Guinness a day from my grandmother oh, yes. in, in her later life, one would assume perhaps what they should be doing is prescribing something like Norfolk Punch instead of the Coke and, the, and all the sugared eyed yes, drinks that yeah, are there. Yeah. Perhaps that may give us a more healthy yeah, nation. Yeah. But on that very high note, <laughs> well-being to the nation, thank you very much for joining us today at Felix Doe TV. Look forward to seeing you next week when the uh, very interesting and very long life story of young Eric will be resumed, along with the support actor Bella the Magnificent. Here she is. I don't know whether we've got her on camera. <laughs> Perhaps we haven't. Perhaps we haven't switched camera. But we are having new staff. And there, there's Bella. Look, just the bottom end. Say bye-bye, Bella. Or Bella, say bye-bye, rather. Okay, so we'll leave you with Bella Fokan.